Praise the Lord. How many of y'all are ready for a word from God uh, this morning? Amen. If you can, if you have your Bible, open your Bible to John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. I commend you for making this day about the truth rather than just family tradition. There is a great victory that was won today many years ago. And how many of y'all know we need to celebrate that, always celebrate that and live that out in our lives, amen. And a lot of times people, we forget the meaning, ain't nothing wrong with family tradition, ain't nothing wrong with having barbecues and going out to the lake, amen. But that's not the real reason for the season, amen. Let us celebrate the truth first, amen, that Jesus not only died, but he rose on the third day. How many of you are thankful that he rose, not just for me, he rose for you and I. Unless you're incapacitated or disabled, cannot do so, we ask that you stand in reverence for the reading of God's word. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Notice they were in fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace be with you. Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands, his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Amen. Next verse. So Jesus said to them again, once again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. I'm going to minister and teach on the subject, how to deal with devastation. How to deal with devastation. I don't know what situation has devastated your life this morning. But I want to tell you something. There is one. His name is Jesus, and he can help you how to deal, to persevere, survive, and not only survive, but thrive in the midst of of your devastation. Grab the hand of the person next to you. Let us bow our head in prayer. Lord, Father, we just thank you for what you've already done in the praise and worship. Lord God, we open up our hearts to receive from you this morning, to receive your word, your word that builds our faith, your word that transforms our mindset, your word that makes us more like you, your word that empowers us, your word that you said in the book of Ephesians is a weapon. And we pull out our weapon today. We open our minds to be transformed. Lord God, that we may prove what is your acceptable will and purpose on this earth. We give you praise and we give you glory, Lord God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, put your hands together. Give it up for Jesus. High five two people and have your seat this morning. Amen. Don't punch them. Just high five them. Please. I could have just a tad bit of monitor. A little bit more monitor. If you have lived long enough, you will experience devastation in your life. You've lived long enough, you will go through something that will just devastate you and devastate those that are connected to you. Have you ever gone through something that was so overwhelming, so tragic that it just crushed the faith out of you, it just sucked the faith out of you, your faith in God, your faith in yourself? Have you ever been through something so so tragic, made you not want to live or made you second guess yourself and your purpose that God has given you. I'll never forget 
a couple of years ago, before we started Elevate Ministries, I was a youth pastor, and we had took close to around 80 to 90 youth to a youth retreat. And after a wonderful, tremendous service, we had the youth gathered in a circle praying and thanking God for what he had just done. And in the, as soon as we finished praying, I received the call on my cell phone that my mom had passed away and she had died in our house. And for the next couple of hours, it seemed like I just went deaf I, I, or in blind. I mean, I could hear, but I wasn't hearing what anybody had to say. I could see, but I didn't want to see what I was seeing. And I, I never forget, uh, the only thing that was going through my mind on the three-hour drive back home that night was, am I going to see her before they remove her body from the house? And, and, and my faith was, was crushed. And, and in our text, there are some guys that we just read about that can relate to me and can relate to you as far as being devastated because of something tragic that has happened in their life. The disciples loved Christ. The disciples, for they gave three years of their best of their life as young men hanging around with Jesus, serving Jesus, learning from Jesus. And now Jesus had died. And he just didn't die like getting shot or, or, or just, you know, in a car accident. Not that, there's, not that that is not tragic. Uh, that is tragic. But he died in a very bu- uh, brutal way flesh hanging off his bones and or- his organs exposed on the cross and blood pouring out of his body and you could smell the blood because there's so much pouring out of him he was disfigured his own mother didn't even recognize him and here you have people surrounding him who loved him and cared about him and they are just losing it his mom was losing it was having I'm I'm, I'm assuming was having a nervous breakdown as she saw her son being killed in the manner that he was being killed, naked, humiliated. And now Jesus has died and he is in the grave. And here you have the disciples in fear. Here you have the disciples devastated by what they saw and what is transpiring in their life. They have no hope. The one that did give them hope is dead. But in the midst of all that, Jesus shows up. Can I tell you that even in the midst of devastation, that Jesus will show up in your situation, amen? Amen. Your devastation does not intimidate Jesus. The tragic uh, situation that you are going through will not make Jesus back away. Your sin does not scare Jesus. God will show up. And he will show off his power if you allow him to this morning. So the question is, how does one deal with devastation? How does one deal with devastation? Well, if you're taking notes, and I encourage you, you must rise above. You must rise above your circumstances. The apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, he says, I have learned to be content in any circumstance that I've been through. And he writes the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians is also the famous scripture that everyone writes when they're trying to lose weight. I can do all things through Christ who lives in me. (laughs) If you would only know the context in which that was written, you would maybe think twice about writing that scripture. Paul was writing this from a prison. Paul was writing, but yet he was in a prison, but yet he was still praising God. He was in a prison, but he was still encouraging people to rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. He had lost. He had been through shipwrecks, had died and been resurrected. He had been through all types, all types of hell and high water. But yet, no matter whether he was in the prison, no matter if he was in a palace preaching to high officials or wherever he was at, whether in poverty or in much, Paul said, I have learned to be content. What that scripture means is when we think of contentment, we usually think of finding satisfaction within oneself. Finding satisfaction within oneself. But Paul was not talking about finding satisfaction, being content by looking deep within yourself or thinking yourself positive. That's not what he was talking about. Or finding satisfaction on on what you own or what you've accomplished. 
Because how many of y'all know what you own and what you've accomplished or who you know can change in a heartbeat? What Paul was saying is, I have learned to have satisfaction no matter what I go through because my satisfaction doesn't come from what I own or who I know as far as people-wise, but my satisfaction comes from my relationship with Jesus Christ. He gives me joy when I have no reason to be happy. He gives me peace when everything is chaotic around me. I have learned to be content in anything that, I've go in anything that I'm going through. If you're going to rise above, your satisfaction, there's nothing wrong with having satisfaction in your career. There's nothing wrong with having satisfaction in, in, in things, but that should just be a resource. Your ultimate source of satisfaction should come from Jesus Christ. Because if, you're, if your contentment is not rooted in Christ, when your circumstances change, so will your joy and your peace. See, but when you find contentment, in Christ, in a God who says, I am God and I change not. I am the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. I was a God that gave Nehemiah joy in the book of the Old Testament, and the joy was his strength. I was a God that gave Paul joy and peace in a prison. I am still the same God that will give you joy and peace in whatever situation you are going through. We must not only, if we're going to rise above we must not only find contentment in Christ, we must also notice this. We must practice it, it, what determines if we're going to rise above is your response to your adversity, is your response to your devastation. How are you responding to your tragedy right now? How are you responding to the loss of your job, to the loss of a loved one? How are you responding to your enemies that are making your life miserable and slandering you and doing all types of evilness against you? There's a famous scripture that everyone likes to quote. It says, all things work together for those who love Jesus. You love God, well, your tragedy will work for your triumph. But what does it mean to love God? Jesus said, if you love me, you will not only hear my word, you will do my word. So, in essence, what is coming against you won't work for you unless you respond with obedience to the word of God. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7 says that with much diligence, when you practice diligence, that virtue and knowledge, and the God's word translation says, Christ's kindness would be added, will be added to your faith, to your character. It says, when you practice brotherly love, your character gets built. So in essence, when, when, when he says diligence, he's saying, he's talking about when the best response to your devastation is to give a Christ-like response. The best response if you're diligent, you will respond to your devastation by responding like Christ. And when you respond like Christ to your devastation, your negative becomes a positive in your life. It adds to your character. What does it add? Notice it says it will add brotherly love. In the, in the original language, brotherly love uh, is where we get the word Philadelphia. You ever been to Philadelphia? Who knows what that means? The city of brotherly love. There's a church of Philadelphia. But brotherly love is more than just showing love to your brother or to your sister. It goes deeper than that. It is helping other people while you yourself are going through pain and tragedy. And the reason why I make mention of that is because a lot of times when tragedy strikes, we tend to stop helping people. We tend to stop serving God. We tend to lose the faith. And we should not allow tragedy to stop us. I'm not saying to, to not focus on your dilemma. But when your only focus 
is on your tragedy, it can paralyze you from stopping, from helping other people. Jesus showed brotherly love while he was being crucified. He said, uh, make sure my mom gets taken care of. John, behold your mother. He was showing brotherly love. He was still helping other people while he himself was suffering. He was on the cross, flesh hanging off his bones, blood pouring out, nails through his hands, crown of thorns on his head. And yet while he was on the cross suffering and crying, he ministers to two criminals. He was still, even as he was dying, he was still helping people. Even as he was still suffering, he was helping those that were suffering also. I want to encourage you, as hard as it may be, I want to I encourage you not to allow your tragedy to stop you from helping other people. When you begin to help other people while you yourself are carrying your cross or being crucified, God will bless you and add to your character brotherly love. And it says, the God's word translation says, Christ's kindness. And what that has to do in the original language is agape, agape love. It means a God type of love. A love that can only come from God. Flow in you and through you. And, and what that has to deal, what that talks about is how do you respond to your haters? How do you respond to your offenders? We must respond with a Christ likeness. When you respond with a Christ, see, you can't control what people do to you, but you can control your response. You can't control what you can't. It was out of your control, that person lying on you. It was out of your control, that person cussing you out. It was out of your control, your crazy ex-girlfriend key in your car. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Say the pastor's not talking about me. He's talking about the person behind us. It was out of your control, your loved one getting shot. It was out of your control, your loved one getting raped. It was out of your control, your wife cheating on you. It was out of your control, your husband cheating on you. You can't control what they did. But how many of y'all know you can control how you respond? When you respond and you fight fire with fire, you stoop to their level. But when you respond the God way, the Jesus way, you rise above and you take the highway, not the low way, the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. <laughs> blessed in the city, blessed in the country, blessed in the body. Oh, wherever I'm at, I'm blessed because I respond to my haters, hallelujah, like Jesus did. Don't get me, I'll start preaching. Then your haters make become your elevators that take you higher in Christ Jesus. Do anybody got some haters here? Hallelujah. Tell them your pastor said that I, you're going to love them like Jesus. It's not just, and notice it says virtue. Virtue there is not moral excellence. It is not moral excellence. What it is, it, 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 it's a word that describes the exercising of your faith. A lot of people want the shout victory, but they don't want to go through the battle. A lot of people want the crown of glory, but they don't want to wear the crown of thorns. A lot of people want a resurrection, but they don't want to die to themselves. A lot of people want a stronger faith, but they don't want to go through anything that's going to build their faith. How do you think your faith is going to get stronger? When you go through things and, and what... What Peter is saying here in this scripture is that as you, as you go through adversity, as you go through suffering, if you respond, because th just because you go through devastation don't mean that you're responding in a God-like way. When you respond in a Christ-like response and hold your faith and stand your ground, your adversity becomes your gold's gin. <laughs> For you ladies, your adversity becomes your Zumba. <laughs> Maybe y'all get that better. When someone goes to exercise, if they do it continuously, not just one time or in the new year, 
It will make them stronger and more healthier, a better person. And can I tell you that if you will stand on, stand your ground and stand on God's word and continue having faith in him and continue praising him and continue seeking him out, hallelujah, your weight, your adversity will be your weight room that's going to make you stronger. It's going to add to your... Somebody shout, rise above. Touch two people and tell them, rise above. How do you deal with devastation? You let Jesus make an entrance into your heart. Let Jesus make an entrance into your heart. Notice, when Jesus, before he showed up, they locked all the doors. Because they, they, they were in fear. They didn't want, they were in fear of the Jewish high priest doing something bad to them and hurting them. And they locked all the doors, but yet Jesus shows up and he says, peace be with you. Then he says, peace be with you. And, and, he, and he wasn't talking about like, you know, like peace. He was in show up and like, you know. <laughs> That's not what Jesus did. He dropped the mic and walked off. That's not the type of peace he did. And, and, and you may got to ask yourself, if you're reading the text, why did Jesus say peace be with you twice? See, because the first peace had to deal with being at peace with God. Being at peace with God. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. It says that when we put our faith in Christ. We now become at peace with God. And we can be at peace with God because of what Jesus has done on the cross and in the grave. See, that's good because some of you should have shouted amen because no matter how bad you've been, what you've done, even if they have a YouTube clip of you doing it, no matter how dirty your past was, God says, I forgive you. Come to me just the way you are and I won't leave you the way I found you. But at the same time, not everybody that doesn't serve God are bad people. You have to understand that not everybody that doesn't serve God are bad people. Just because they don't uh, serve God don't mean that they're evil people. They just don't have God in their life. And, and at the same time, no matter how good you are, you, you eat organic oatmeal. You rescue dogs from the Humane Society. You, you volunteer your time with the elderly people. And so they can have a dance. <laughs> ah, I just made that up. I don't know. Sorry if you do. But if you don't smoke or chew or hang around with those that do, no matter how good you are or how bad you are, if you don't have Jesus, amen, you are not at peace with God. Because it's not about what we can do. It's about what he already has done. On the cross, by his stripes, we are healed. By his wounds, we are forgiven. It's not about what you can do. It's about what Jesus did. He just didn't die. He rose so that you can die to yourself but also rise in the new resurrection power, living a new life. All he asks of you is to believe. To believe in him. When you believe, see, you can't, don't. If you're shutting the doors of your heart, don't expect Jesus to live inside you. Jesus said in the book of Revelations, I knock at the door of your heart. And, and for some of you here this morning, Jesus is, and it's not the Jehovah Witness either. And it's not CPS telling them they're going to disconnect your, <laughs> and it's not the, war, the warrant roundup either. A couple of days ago, they were doing the Wart Roundup for, for some of the members that you don't see here today. Well, you know where they're at. 
But you know what I believe what God is doing? He's not doing a warrant roundup. He's doing a loss roundup. He's doing a hurting roundup. He's doing a deliverance roundup. He's rounding up all the oppressed and possessed and those that are bound with chains. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and I have come to open blind eyes and I have come to set the captives free. God is going to do a roundup here this morning. All you got to do is open your, the door of your heart. Let Jesus in, baby. Look at your neighbor and tell him, let Jesus in, baby. Now, if that's not your spouse, then maybe you may get punched. One from your wife, and then one from whoever you... <laughs> so, the first one was peace with God. You got to make a choice to invite Jesus Christ into your heart. Jesus... I don't care who's popular or what popular talk show is saying there's many ways to God. Jesus said there's only way. I'm the only way. I'm the door. There's only one truth, and that's Jesus Christ. See, we're not just here to celebrate because he died. Everyone has somebody in our family that died. Muhammad died. Buddha, if he really existed, he died too, the chubby dude. But there's only one that got back up, and his name was Jesus Christ. And because he got back up, you can get back up and live for eternity and be empowered on earth. It's, it's not about the brisket that expands your waist today. It's about the Lamb of God who came to take away our sins. His name was Jesus Christ. It's not about the rabbit. It's about the resurrection it's not about breaking cascarones. It's about a man named Jesus who broke out of the tomb so that we could have victory in our marriage, in our life, in our family, in our career. It's about Jesus today. It's about Jesus every day if you're a believer. Now, that's all I got to say about that. But there is the peace of God, but... Excuse me, there is peace with God, and there is the peace of God. See, that was the second peace. See, there's a lot of people that are, peace with, are at peace with God, but they don't got the peace of God. There are a lot of people that are at peace. They know, why they're go they know where they're going. They're going to heaven, but while they're still on earth, they're still filled with fear. They're still filled with anxiety. They're still, they're always paralyzed. They always go. <laughs> In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, the apostle Paul says, it talks about the peace that passes all understanding that will guard your heart. And we like to quote that cute, cute scripture, the peace that passes all understanding, guard me. But if you're going to quote that scripture, quote what it says before. It says, when you go unto God with your problems in prayer, and when you begin to praise him and give him thanksgiving, then the peace that passes all understanding will guard your heart. Do you pray? Look at your neighbor and tell your, and tell your neighbor, bro, do you live? No, I mean, do you pray? Do you praise? See, you, you can't have the peace if there is no prayer. You, you can't have the joy where there is no thanksgiving. That word, guard your heart, uh, conveys the meaning of an umpire. Or a referee, like an umpire that you see in maybe in a, a, a baseball game or a referee, see, is their responsibility to eject anybody, uh, any player that has unsportsmanlike conduct. It is their responsibility to even re eject fans that are being crazy and acting dumb. 
So basically what it's saying is that as you begin to pray and as you begin to seek God or as you begin to thank him, uh, what the word is saying, Paul is saying that the Holy Spirit, it activates the Holy Spirit's peace and it begins to eject every thought of fear, every thought of anxiety, every thought that says you're going to die, every thought that says of hopelessness. It begins to eject it and kick it out of the game. Some of you got some fans of fear that got season tickets to your soul. And that's why you can't slam dunk. That's why you can't hit it out of the park. That's why you're on a losing streak. But God said, if you'll begin to pray and call out on my name, if you'll just begin to praise me in the midst of your anxiety, in the midst of your depression, God says, I'll eject, I'll kick out every thought of fear. Stop thinking about your problems and start thanking the Jesus who can solve your problems. Stop thinking about only what you lost and start thanking him about what you still have. I may have lost a car, but thank God I still got my family. I may have lost a house, but thank God I still have my kids. Uh, I may have lost a job, but thank God I still got my health. Uh, I may have lost a son, but thank God I still got a daughter. Uh, I may have lost a daughter, uh, but thank God I still got my wife. Uh, I may have lost this in my health, but I still got my praise. I haven't lost my faith. Uh, I haven't lost uh, my praise your life i haven't lost hallelujah the joy of the lord stop thinking about what you lost and begin to praise him for what you still got and that's all i gotta say about that the last point is wait for the full course meal Touch two people and tell them, wait for the full course meal. You know, I, I, I grew up in a single parent home, and we had barbecues, but it wasn't a man barbecuing, it was a woman barbecuing outside. A any single moms can relate in the house, cutting the yard, barbecuing, fighting dudes. Nah, I'm playing. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> See, my, 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 my mom could fight. But she would barbecue. And, and I had a habit of picking at the food when she wasn't looking. So what she would do is she would cut a piece of fajita out. And she would give it to me. And she said, that's just a taste of what's to come. And just hold on for what's coming. Let that hold you down. But that was just a sample. The fajita, the piece of fajita was just a sample. If I would just wait. I had more coming to me. I had potato salad coming to me. I had ribs coming to me. I had my mom's famous fruit salad, anointed fruit salad that'll make you talk in tongues coming to me. But all I had to do was just wait and not, get, and not just get satisfied with a sample, but wait on my mother to give me the full course meal. See, Jesus came into the room, and he breathed on them. And you know he had good breath. I mean, he didn't have, like, demonic breath, you know. I mean, the dude was the king of the world. You know his breath smells so fresh and so clean, clean. But he breathed into them the Holy Spirit. But he said, look, don't get satisfied. This was just a taste of what's to come. Because the fullness of the Holy Ghost is going to fall in the book of Acts. 
But tarry here, just wait on me, because your full course meal, the power of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost that can transform your life, the Holy Ghost that can take a pothead and make him a preacher, the Holy Ghost that can make, take a cokehead and make him sold out for Christ. The Holy Ghost that can take unfaithful men and women and make them sold out to Jesus and to their loved ones. The Holy Ghost that when you lay hands, that sick bodies, that cancer has to go and diabetes got to go. The Holy Ghost. Romans 8, 11 said, Jesus said, the very same spirit that resurrected me now lives in the inside of you. What God wants to do this morning is just a little taste. Thomas missed out on getting a little taste because he didn't show up. If you only eat on Easter Sunday, you're going to starve spiritually. What God wants to do here is just a little taste of healing. Is just a little taste of deliverance. Is just a little taste of his peace. Is just a little taste of his joy. Is just a little taste of what he wants to do. Keep on coming so you can get the full course meal, baby. Keep on serving God so you can get everything that God has for your life. God just don't want to save you. He wants to use you to set others free. God just don't want to bless you. He wants to bless you so that you can be a blessing to the lost. So that you can be a blessing to the broken. So that you can be a blessing to somebody else. God doesn't just want to send you to heaven and, and just you just wait until you die. God wants to give you some Holy Ghost power while you're still on the earth. So you can make a dense size Jesus Mark, history maker, world changer. But there are some of you here, under the sound of my voice, that you have been faithful to God. And you have been serving God with a passion. But it seems like God is silent with you. I want to tell you, everything that you've seen in the past, that victory that God gave you a year ago, that blessing that God gave you a month ago, the transformation that God did in 2014 or 15, I want to tell you that's just a little taste of what, what is to come. If you do not quit in due season, if you do not quit in due season, you're going to reap everything that you have sown, you may have sown tears, but you're going to reap joy. You may have sown brokenness, but you're going to reap blessing. You may have sown failure, but you're going to reap victory. If you do not quit, you're going to... But don't let, don't think that just because Jesus is silent, that he's not going to do anything. Let's, let's, let, let's let there be some silence real quick. Just because it's silent don't mean that something's not happening. Jesus was silent. He was killed on a Friday. But on Saturday. Silent. What happened, Jesus? I thought you were going to do something. I thought you were going to help us. And all the disciples get is. Some of you have been asking God, God, what about this and what about that? And I thought you said you were going to do this and you showed me this was going to happen. And all you've gotten is. See, but can I tell you. He was silent on a Saturday so that we could celebrate on a Sunday. Y'all missed a good time to shout right there. He was silent on a Saturday 
in a grave so that on Sunday he could kick open the grave and make some noise and say, I am the resurrection. I have defeated death. I have defeated sickness. I have defeated your depression. I have defeated your brokenness. I have defeated Satan. I, he was silent on a Saturday so we can make some noise and celebrate on a Sunday. On a Sunday. On a Sunday. On a Sunday, he got up. On a Sunday, he gave him peace. On a Sunday, he gave him joy. On a Sunday, he walked healed, no longer scarred. On a Sunday, touch three people and tell them, it's Sunday. It's Sunday, it's Sunday, it's Sunday, it's Sunday. Make some noise for your full course blessing. Make some noise for your full course miracle. Make some noise for your full course deliverance. Make some noise for your victory that's coming to you. Make some noise. God has been silent because he's going to make some noise today. Shout. Let's shake the balconies of heaven with the praise. Give them your praise. Give them your thanksgiving that we don't serve a dead God, but we serve a God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, your Jesus, my Jesus. He ain't dead. He got us. It's coming. It's coming. He's been silent, but he's about to speak. I said he's been silent, but he's about to speak. You don't need me. You can praise him all by yourself. See, when you're really thankful, you don't need a preacher to stir you up. All you got to do is look back over your life and see where Jesus has brought you to and where he's taken you. And you can't help but give him the glory. You can't help but give him the praise. Can anybody in here think back where God has brought him from, where he's brought them to, and where he's taken you, and give God a praise? That's all I got to say about that.